as I came into the beautiful harbor of Havana, my one thought was to land and go where all good Americans go when they go to Cuba. Can you guess where? Sloppy Joe's, the mecca where tourists seek courage and inspiration. And believe me, a vagabond needs them both. Around the corner is the presidential palace, which has harbored so many presidents of late. Then on up the Prado, Havana's most beautiful promenade, and we come to the latest jewel in Cuba's crown, the imposing capital larger and more beautiful than our own capital in Washington. By the merest chance, I was able to obtain this historic view. In the center of the group coming down the steps is ex-President Machado, leaving the capital for the last time. In the armored car, you see, he was rushed to the airport, whence he flew into exile forever. Leaving the capital, we drive down the Prado again, passing clubs, hotels, restaurants, and handsome residences. As we turn at the end to follow the ocean driveway, we get our first glimpse of the famous Morro Castle across the harbor. Here, a beautiful statue was erected to the memory of General Maceo, who laid down his life in Cuba's fight for independence. We drive on for miles over perfect roads, through the park-like subdivisions with flower-bordered boulevards, and we come to Beach House, the meeting place for the elect at bathing time. All winter long, the beach is gay with Cubans and visitors. The exclusive yacht club and the military club are in the background. Even nudists and sun worshippers find the gentle shade of the palms grateful at times. My appetite whetted by a delightful swim, I drove out to a beautiful estate that had been converted into a glorified roadhouse. They have christened it Sans Souci, and very appropriately too. You know, it would be hard to find a more charming place in which to forget one's cares. As I approach, I hear captivating strains of Cuban music that suggest the native dance, the rumba, and my hopes rise high. Sure enough, a genuine Cuban rumba, danced by the most expert and beautiful mulatto girl in Cuba. Hey, I guess they need more courage. Well, perhaps they'll see double now. But I can see only one, and one is plenty, believe me. Boy, what a shimmy. Go to it, Chica. Bravo, bravo, bravo. When I woke up, my train was running smoothly through a landscape of tropical splendor. I was on my way to Matanzas, a beautiful seaport on the north coast, when sugar is exported on a large scale. The chief industry is rope making. The rope is made of sisal or henequen, a tough fiber that is found in these enormous leaves. The leaves are cut at the base with machetes. They are taken to a large mill where they are crushed. The pulp is washed away and the fiber is dried and bleached in the sun. The fiber is then twisted into ropes of all sizes by modern machinery. Again, the railroad takes me through a fairy landscape. The royal palm, which is native to Cuba, abounds. These graceful trees have been aptly called the feather dusters of the gods. And now we come to Trinidad, a typical Cuban small town on the south coast, where it is decidedly hotter. The little church faces the well-lighted park, where the citizens congregate in the cool of the evening to discuss politics and other matters. On certain feast days, the ambitious young bloods of the village gather in the main street to show off their horsemanship to an admiring crowd. Here come a lot of youngsters eager to pick up some points against the day when they shall be big enough to perform also. And here they come, rather tough work for the horses, prancing on these rough cobblestones, and still tougher for the rider if he should get a fall. Watch it there, look out! There you are, he has done it. A good job. Well, here they come and there they go. 
Camagüey, near the center of the island, is an important town. The province is rich in timber, copper mines, and sugar plantations. The extensive meadows are ideal for cattle raising. The guava jelly made here is known the world over, and the Camagüey cheese enjoys a national reputation. The appearance of the town remains very much as it was in the old days of Spanish rule. The market is still held in the open streets near the cathedral. This cathedral dates back to Spanish days and is typical of Spanish architecture. In the interior, the figure of the patron saint of Cuba is displayed over the altar, the Caridad del Cobre. Here it is. The picturesque Camagüey Hotel used to be a cavalry barracks when Spain occupied the island. These enormous jars served to store rainwater before they had waterworks. The patios are a riot of color and tropical luxuriance. Artists have come from afar to seek inspiration here. An old Spanish canon reminds us that Cuba was not always free, but these pretty carefree Cuban misses are sublimely unconscious of what their forebears suffered and graciously allow the cameraman to shoot them at will. A private garden where peace and happiness reign beneath Cuban skies as the soft breezes rustle gently through the palms. Here comes a fine type of gentleman farmer of the old school. He is going out to inspect his pasture lands. Cattle thrives in this wonderful climate where the grass is green and lush the whole year round. The Cuban cowboy is a fine specimen of manhood and a mighty clever horseman. He takes good care of his cattle, the while he laughs and sings as if the Cuban sunshine had entered his very soul. We now travel northwards from Camagüey to the Atlantic shore and come to an settlement called Nuevitas. The principal industry here is the cultivation of oranges. They are not equal in appearance to our oranges, but they are much sweeter and juicier. Trees like this, loaded down with luscious mangoes, abound throughout the island. The famous Cuban mamoncillo, or the honeyberry tree, is well named, for its fruit is delicious and almost as sweet as these two charming senoritas. They are both wealthy, one of them is heiress to 11 million. But wealth has not turned their heads. They received us with that dignified simplicity and frank cordiality that is so characteristic of the Cubans. We regretfully leave them to take the train to the far eastern end of the island, Santiago, made famous by the final victory of the Cubans over their Spanish oppressors. We motor into this interesting town built on a hillside with its narrow sloping streets. Not far from here, on San Juan Hill, the Cubans, by popular subscription, erected a beautiful statue to Theodore Roosevelt, whom they still idolize as a token of their undying gratitude. The cathedral here is beautiful and very interesting, but many travelers are far more interested in this. The entrance to the famous Bacardi distillery, where the famous Rom Bacardi is so artfully brewed. Large stores of the amber fluid are in readiness for repeal. Trucks are all loaded and ready to rush to the first steamer bound for the United States just as soon as the gong rings. A delightful way to cool off after a hot day. And as I gazed on this peaceful scene, you know, it was hard for me to picture those tragic days 35 years ago when Cervera, the gallant Spanish admiral, daringly sailed out of Santiago Harbor against such overwhelming odds. But then, his doom meant the rebirth of the Cuban nation and liberty. Adios, Cuba.